I, uh, when I was growing up, uh, my teachers used to yell at me for speaking too loud in the library. Uh, so I feel a little uncomfortable today uh, speaking, <laughs> speaking up. Uh, if somebody gets up and, and hits me, I'll understand why. Um, I, I want to start out uh, first by expressing my deep appreciation to the Foundation, uh, Karolinska and the committee uh, for the prize. Uh, I, think, I think it is an important signal to the field of medical education research uh, that what is being done is valued. And I think it sets a wonderful standard. And the fact that it's, that it, that it's in partnership with Karolinska makes it all that much more important. So I'm, I'm deeply appreciative of it. And um, I, I think that this is, this is a, a wonderful, wonderful thing for medical education. So, so thank, you for, thank you for supporting it. And thank, thanks to the Karolinska for having the prize uh, and, and, and for uh, considering me for it. Um, so today, what I'm going to talk about is increasing the quality and capacity of healthcare uh, through and the role of educational institutions in that. Uh, this is a relatively small group, so you should feel free to interrupt at any point with questions, challenges, any, any concerns you have. Um, so all right. there we go. Um, so as, as, I, as I look around the world, it, it seems to me that there are two really big challenges. You like the sign on the, the bridge? <laughs> uh, yes, we have, a, we have an obesity problem in the U.S. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the major uh, challenges in uh, healthcare is capacity. If you, look at, if you look at reports from the World Health Organization, uh, what their, their projections are that we will have a 13 million person health workforce shortfall, shortfall within the next uh, 10 to 15 years. So we're already in a shortfall. And that, that is exacerbated by a series of things like physician migration, uh, maldistribution, uh, poor production. Uh, and as part of this, low income countries are uh, most adversely affected. If you look at the situation in sub-Saharan Africa in terms of healthcare workforce, it's absolutely dire. Uh, the, the, the population per doctor um, in sub-Saharan Africa is about 50,000 to one. That compares with sort of four to 600 per, per, per person, 400 people to doctors in North America and Europe. So the, the, it's, it's a devastating problem. Uh, and clearly, the WHO work, uh, work has shown that there's a relationship between, work for, between worker density and mortality and morbidity. The second, boy, this is, the second problem is that quality is often compromised. Um, the, um, there's been work in the U.S. Uh, to err is human, published by the Institute of Medicine. Uh, basically found that 40% of the hospitalizations in the U.S., 40% of admissions, end up in some harm to patients. Uh, in the U.S., there are race and income disparities, significant disparities. Uh, there's the absence of evidence-based standards, and there's a, a significant problem, at least in the U.S., in terms of continuity of care. Um, the, I have traveled to a number of countries, and I know that these issues are not unique to the U.S., that in fact many countries experience exactly these same things. So given the, the dual challenges of capacity and quality, um, it's clear that some of the responses to these are well beyond the ability of health professions schools to address. So health professions schools can't reform the healthcare system. Uh, they can't finance the healthcare system differently. They can't make uh, uh, policies regarding health, uh, health uh, workforce migration. Uh, they have nothing to do with trade agreements. So there are many things that in medical institutions, nursing institutions can't do about, educational institutions cannot do about this. But there are some things they can do. Four things I think I'm going to talk about today. One is they can admit the right students. Second, they can increase the efficiency of learning. Third, improve the quality of faculty. And fourth, create lifelong relationships with physicians in the healthcare system in order to improve the quality of care. So I'll talk about each of those four in turn. 
the right students. One of the reasons that quality and capacity is limited is because the population doesn't match the healthcare workforce. And that's, that's an issue for both healthcare delivery and is, as well a, a, an issue for research. Um, there's good evidence that a representative delivery workforce leads to improved access to care. As well, it, it increases the opportunity for a match between a doctor and a patient in terms of characteristics like ethnicity and race. And those things end up with increased trust from patients and increased compliance. So it has a direct impact on the quality of health care. Uh, in addition to that, a diverse student faculty population enhance the cultural competence of everyone they interact with in the educational institution. Mm -hmm. A representative workforce also has an impact on research. A representative workforce is going to ask different research questions than one that's not representative. And I think this is particularly important when you, when you look at implementation study and effectiveness study. In addition, um, this has been shown to be particularly important in terms of innovation and problem solving. There's a wonderful series of studies that show that diverse groups, groups that contain uh, uh, folks of different ethnicity, different gender, uh, are much more innovative and much better problem solvers than homogeneous groups. So, what can we do about this? Well, obviously, it would be really wonderful to be able to completely reform primary and secondary education because that's where the problem really begins. Uh, but that's, that's not going to be possible uh, for quite some time. So there are some other things that can be done. Uh, one is to, is to shape interest in the health professions. Your microphone doesn't work. My microphone doesn't work? Is that better? No. no. Oh, my god. Am I back? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I was afraid my battery had died. Um, so one of the second strategy is shape and inspire interest. Uh, m there are many health profession schools around the world now who are, who are that are creating relationships with primary and secondary schools for the purpose of generating interest in careers in health professions. A second thing to do is to change the admission process. Make sure that the criteria used for admission are broadened so that it includes a number of people. Make sure that diversity is one basis for making the decision and ensuring that the folks who sit on the committee that actually make those decisions is diverse as well. And in fact, there are many schools around the world now that are using a holistic admission process. So they've abandoned, they've abandoned the looking at somebody's examination scores and admitting them based on who did best on the test and now take a number of things into account. And finally, to, to provide support to students, both educational support and financial support. Uh, certainly in a country like the U.S. where everybody has to pay for their own education, uh, it is, it's critical to provide some kind of financial support. Um, did my battery die again? No. I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, the the, the uh, last issue relates to providing help, both educational and financial, uh, to students. Uh, and in, in countries like the U.S., this is absolutely essential. Um, kids from uh, backgrounds that are disadvantaged, economically, racially, whatever, uh, are not going to have access to education without these kinds of supports. I think you should keep your microphone closer to your mouth. <laughs> I, I'll do. Is that is that better? I'm sorry. Uh, this is these are more technical problems than I usually have. <laughs> All right. So so we're going to go one at a time. So the the uh, in summary of uh, attracting the right students and uh, representative healthcare workforce leads to improved delivery, it leads to improved research, and it also leads to a better educational culture. Uh, and some strategies for change include shaping uh, interest in health professions education, uh, changing the admissions process, and providing help to potential students. Second thing is educational efficiency. 
Um, capacity and quality are obviously affected by the efficiency with which we can educate students in the health professions. And over the past few years, um, well, longer than the f past few years, there's been a distinction in assessment between summative assessment and formative assessment. Are folks familiar with those terms? Yeah, yeah? okay. Um, so most assessment nowadays is summative in most educational institutions. Uh, tests are built to make decisions about people. They're not de designed in order to help learning, in order to assist students as they learn, formative assessment. And feedback is absolutely critical to learning. There's a wonderful uh, uh, meta-analysis of meta-analyses done by a guy named Hattie uh, in Australia. And what he did is he summarized all the thousands of studies, elementary, secondary, higher education, on what influences achievement. And what he found is that one of the biggest influences on, on achievement is feedback. And in fact, feedback alone has a huge impact on how well students achieve. Um, in his study, a, a standard deviation, which is a huge effect, uh, in his study, 79% of a standard deviation is the effect of feedback alone. So that's a massive impact for feedback. Uh, this was uh, replicated in medical education, many fewer studies, of course, by John Velosky and his colleagues at Jefferson Medical College, uh, and they found the same thing. In 70 or 75% of the studies, feedback alone made a difference to achievement. So the, the, the advantage of formative uh, assessment is that it provides feedback, and that feedback will drive uh, learning. Unfortunately, Feedback tends to be relatively limited in medicine. So there are a series of studies, uh, Jen Kogan and her mm. colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania surveyed all the clerkship directors in the United States and asked how many of you have a, uh, some sort of formative assessment as part of your curriculum. And what she found is that roughly a quarter had any kind of uh, a formative assessment. Um, we did a study a long, long time ago now, uh, with Susie Day, we, we sent a survey to all the first year trainees in internal medicine in the United States. And we asked them, how often have you been observed with a patient? And what they, about 80% of them said that they had been observed once and only once during the entire first year of training. So the, the, the student trainees are not being watched in medicine. And at least in the US context, things are no better in surgery. Uh, there was a recently, re recently a survey of uh, general surgery residents about their, their, their teaching in the operating room. And what, they, what, what their results are are that faculty identified preoperative goals for trainees in less than a fifth of the instances. They identified areas for improvement afterwards in roughly a third. So if you're not watching, you're not giving feedback. And if you're not giving feedback, you're, you're missing one of the best opportunities to push achievement along. So in, in, the, face of, in the face of this, folks have, have said, well, let, let's try to do a little bit more formative assessment. Uh, but the ways they're doing it, I think, have missed the mark entirely. So some people have said, well, let's take our formative assessments and we'll use those and try and give people feedback based on that. Um, a, f a good summative assessment is designed to give a very good overall estimate of somebody's ability. It's not designed to tell somebody what their strengths and weaknesses <coughs> are. It's not designed to give information that's tied to some kind of an educational intervention. So using summative feedback, summative exams, in order to give formative feedback, while it's a lovely thing, it's obviously a good thing to do, clearly isn't, isn't reaching the goal of providing good formative feedback that helps trainees learn, help students learn. The second thing that folks are doing often these days is using formative assessment for summative purposes. So many places where they have workplace-based assessment, where they're observing trainees and giving them feedback in the moment, uh, what they're doing is they're taking th those assessments, they're putting them in a portfolio, and at the end of six months, they're looking at them and making a decision about whether the trainee should be promoted. 
So all of a sudden, the trainees figure out, oops, this isn't really formative. They're not really using it for that. They're really using it to make a decision about me. And it changes the whole nature of the interaction. I've had several faculty tell me that, that if, if somebody gets a rating under those circumstances, it's not unusual for the trainee to say, why did you give me a five and not a six? Why did you give me a six and not a seven? So, so what, what it, it degenerates into a kind of silly argument about, about what the scores are, instead of focusing on the most important thing, which is the feedback that you want to give trainees in order to make them better. And finally, uh, formative assessment, when it is done, is done poorly. Um, when we put together a summative exam, we think about a lot of the characteristics of the exam. We say, is it reliable? Is it valid? Uh, is the content correct? But when people put together formative exams, it's, it's, it's kind of like they don't care. It's sort of, it's sort of like, oh, we're just, give, we're just giving her feedback. What does it matter? You know? and, and that adds tremendously to the inefficiency of education. I, you could be giving me feedback about something that's unreliable, therefore I'll go off and study for, 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 for two or three days to figure out how to do it better, and in fact I might be good enough. And you might be missing places where I really need the feedback. So, going forward, uh, I think it is absolutely critical to increase the amount of formative assessment that's part of training and decrease the amount of summative assessment. Uh, Workplace-based methods are, are useful for these, uh, but there needs to be considerable faculty development before they're at a place where they're ready to go. So in summary, formative assessment with feedback we know, based on the literature, has a huge impact on learning. We also know that we're not doing it well, we're not doing the observations. We know that the current methods we're using are flawed. So going into the future, increased use of this, increased quality of it, is a, is, is, a, is a strategy to address this issue. The third thing uh, I want to talk about is, is faculty development. Uh, the quality and capacity of, of education are limited by a lack of high quality faculty. Um, you wouldn't know that in this institution, certainly. But as you go around the world, the number of medical schools are increasing dramatically at this point. And there is huge contention for faculty. There's, uh, there are schools that are being developed that don't have enough faculty. And there are people traveling around the world looking for faculty to, to, to fill the roles in those schools. Uh, and so faculty development is absolutely key going into the future. Uh, it makes teachers better teachers. But in addition, it offers the opportunity to, to make them change agents. And this is an important part. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Lancet report done by Frank and his colleagues. It was published a few years ago in terms of transforming medical education. They talk about faculty development and the creation of uh, enlightened change agents and suggest working to integrate education and healthcare systems, working to, to, to get faculty to participate in networks and consortia, and to share globally the kinds of educational resources that everyone is using. Um, the advantage of faculty development, the aims of faculty development, are to, to empower faculty to excel as educators, help address some of the shortages, respond to issues of faculty diversity, uh, and as well to create a community that values both teaching and research in medical education and health professions education. And we know that these work. There's a wonderful review of the literature by Yvonne Steinert and her, her colleagues published in 2006, and it's been updated recently with similar results. Uh, faculty development participants were satisfied. Tests showed significant gains in knowledge. You know, that's nice, but what really matters is that as a result of these, there were changes in teaching behavior detected by the students, and that's absolutely critical. And the changes included greater educational involvement and the development of networks to support educators. How we do these, how we structure them, is really important. And Yvonne, in her work, also looked at what are the characteristics of a good faculty development program. And she came up with, with four or five of them, including the fact that experiential learning is important, feedback is valued, peers are important, adherence to principles of teaching and learning are important, as are multiple methods of instruction. <coughs> so all that comes from the literature. 
So let me, oh, this is going to be fun. Uh, let me, <laughs> let me see if I can do this. Had I known this problem, I wouldn't have. Um, one of the things that's obviously very close to my heart is FAMER. And we have developed the FAMER fellowships that we do around the principles that I just outlined in, in, in Yvonne's research. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we identify committed, we identify committed and interested faculty, mostly in low, <coughs> in low income countries. We provide them learn. Oh, that's really, it's hard to make me even less attractive. Um, provide learning around a relevant project. Uh, so all these folks come to us with a project and the project has been approved by the <laughs> dean of their medical school or their nursing school or their pharmacy school. Uh, and that is the centerpiece of their learning. And in that way, we hope to improve health professions, education, and ultimately improve population health. But in addition, we strive to create a critical mass of health professions educators in a region so that they have each other to draw on and support. So the format of this uh, is that folks come to us for one to three weeks. Um, we take on some basic topics and they meet a mentor who's with them for the two year fellowship. Uh, they go back home for 11 months, there's <coughs> distance learning, they work on their projects. They come back for another week or two in year two. We do some more advanced topics. The second year fellows become mentors for the first year fellows. And then they go home and work uh, some more on the projects, support the, the, their mentee, and then hopefully publish or present their work. We now have about a thousand fellows around the world. Um, as I said, the focus of this is on the fellows project. We do as uh, Yvonne's uh, research suggested we should, uh, uh, use multiple methods. The curriculum for this was devised in conjunction with deans of medical and nursing schools about 12 or 15 years ago uh, in Casablanca and heavily represented were low income countries, medical schools and health profession schools in low income countries. And they came up with, with three areas for work. The first are sort of basic educational practice things. So large group teaching, small group teaching, assessment and the like. The second thing that was important to the deans was educational leadership. Uh, so we spend a lot of time on change theory, we spend a lot of time on project management and the like. And scholarship was also important to them. So we encourage the trainees, once they're, the fellows once they're done, to make sure that their work gets published in some fashion. Um, well that, 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 <laughs> that just about does it. <laughs> uh, okay, well I have, I have, I have 14 minutes left and I, <laughs> Uh, we'll just keep right on going. Um, so th these institutes started in Philadelphia in 2001. Uh, we developed a little bit of additional resources and had the opportunity to expand. So rather than making Philadelphia larger, uh, what we decided to do was take these faculty development programs and move them into the regions around the world. Um, that has the advantage of making them relevant uh, it means that the networks uh, locally can develop. Uh, it also makes it much more efficient. It's much more efficient to train somebody where they are than to take them to Philadelphia. Uh, these are all run by FAMER fellows. Uh, it's funded mostly by FAMER. Uh, we have support in Brazil from the Ministry of Health there and we have some, some grant support for some of them, but most of these are FAMER funded. And they're modified to meet regional needs. Every, every, uh, each of the regional institutes take on the characteristics of the area where they're located and, and the, the areas of importance in those regions. Uh, we have four center, uh, three centers in uh, India right now, one in Brazil, one in South Africa, one in China. And uh, we are growing one in the Latin, um, Latin American area. That'll be in Spanish. The Brazil is in uh, Portuguese. Uh, Chinese is currently in English, but it's on its way to Chinese. Um, and we're about to open a fourth in India at Manipal that will focus entirely on interprofessional education. Uh, I'll try to fix it. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, but, uh, you took away my... Uh, 
Do they? Yeah. Well, you'll still, you'll still use it. Go ahead. Yeah, no, but this, this doesn't work. Okay. I can do that. No, no, I can. Got it. Okay. Um, so, um, how do you evaluate this? We spend probably 10 or 15% of our budget on evaluation uh, in order to make sure that we're uh, good stewards of the resources we've been given. Uh, and one of the ways to analyze this, of course, is to look at the people and the individual impacts. And in that, you see all the things that you usually find with any faculty development program. Uh, the folks have changes in knowledge, skills, and attitudes. Many of them have been promoted. Um, we have several deans in the crowd now. Uh, there's a, a bunch of scholarship that, that, that's come out of this. But even more important, we think, is to look at the projects and their impact, because that's a way to judge what we've done. And, and so we analyzed uh, the first 761 projects and published this a few years ago. Um, and what, we, what, we, what, you, what you find is uh, the usual spread of topics. Um, in, most important to us in these is the alignment with the healthcare system. We strongly encourage projects uh, that, uh, that, that encourage the fellows to find ways to align education with the healthcare systems in their regions. Uh, and about a fifth of the projects are that way. And in fact, that's, that's one of the, uh, the most important things to the Brazil Ministry of Health and, and part of the reason they support this. Uh, the nice finding is that roughly half of these uh, have been incorporated into the curriculum or policy in the institutions where they were developed, and roughly a half have been replicated as well. And the positive impacts are significant. There are increased interest in teaching, collaboration within and across departments, uh, increased efficiency, and increased alignment with healthcare. Um, so the Famer Fellowship creates basic skills in education, leadership, and uh, scholarship, uh, generates projects that lead to, to change. Uh, the regional institutes enhance the relevance of what we're doing, and what we have now is an international uh, community of practice that's both regional and international, and these are folks that we keep in touch with each other and who create resources that they share with each other. Sorry. Sorry. No so in summary, quality and capacity uh, is limited uh, by a lack of health professions faculty and faculty development programs can address these. Uh, successful programs can be conducted m with minimal disruption to the, the, the otherwise busy lives of uh, faculty in, in uh, uh, clinical settings. Uh, FAMER is one example of this, one I obviously am very, very fond of, but there are many other excellent programs that accomplish exactly the same goals. And there's good evidence of their effectiveness. Thanks. So the last thing I, I want to talk about is maintenance of competence. Um, at, at the current time, universities uh, don't play very much of a leading role in education uh, after training. By the time doctors, nurses, and pharmacists actually get into practice. Um, and there's, there's good evidence that lifelong learning can Im improve, and formative assessment, can improve quality and capacity. It helps uh, healthcare workers keep up with changes, acquire new skills, um, adapt to change, and it yields important improvements for healthcare. Uh, in addition to this, summative assessment as part of the ongoing and continuing practice of a profession uh, can improve quality by ensuring that that learning has occurred. Sure. Yes. Please, yes. Slide, yes. Uh, how many, how many minutes do you have? Uh, five, five. five to eight. <laughs> I have eight minutes and fifty. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, I will be done. In <laughs> okay. Well, let's let. Uh, okay. All right. Let's stop talking, and we'll get. We'll we'll put this on an express. Okay. Uh, so there. Um, so there is a need for ongoing education. If if you look at the literature, and, and much of this has been studied with doctors. Um, there is a clear de de uh, decline in performance with time since medical school. There was a wonderful uh, systematic review of the literature by Chaudhry, Fletcher, and Samari, Annals of Internal Medicine, 2005. They searched all the papers for a number of years, found 62 that, uh, that uh, fit the criteria. And what they found is that there were 12 uh, studies of knowledge and all reported a decline with age. Um, their adherence to standards for diagnosis, screening, and prevention are the same. 
appropriate therapy is the same, patient outcomes are the same, and in addition there are several extra, since that time, several additional studies of patient outcomes, uh, all of which indic indicate a, a decline in performance with time since training. And the conclusion, uh, their conclusion was that physicians who've been in practice longer may be at risk for providing lower quality care. <coughs> Therefore, this subgroup of physicians may need quality improvement interventions. Yeah? And uh, is this also valid for uh, countries that will have like reassessments of uh, MDs? Yes, yes. Um, in fact, this is what's driving the reassessment programs yeah. in those countries. Okay. Now, whether the reassessment I believe the reassessment will fix that, but it's a little too soon to know because those countries are just beginning, and so we don't we don't we don't know yet. But yes, um, the other thing I, I wanted to, to mention here is that we do know that summative assessment works. We just put a paper into academic medicine um, a, a couple months ago, showed a relationship between performance uh, on a licensing exam and mortality. <laughs> of patients of those doctors following acute myocardial infarction and congestive heart failure. And we found a relationship between those two. The better you did on the examination, the better your patients did uh, in terms of mortality and morbidity. So one of the things I think needs to happen is that the university, the academic world, needs to get closer to the healthcare system and needs to be much more involved in the ongoing uh, uh, assessment of physicians. Um, it, at least in, in the U.S., large parts of this, unfortunately, are done by and funded by pharmaceutical and other device manufacturers, and that leads to a bias in terms of the curriculum for this. Uh, so we need to, I, I think the universities need to create models that limit industry involvement, avoid curricular bias, and enhance participation. Um, second thing is that in order to drive the, ho the, the whole um, sort of continuing education, maintenance of competence world, there needs to be data for individual physicians and healthcare providers on how their patients are doing. So putting that information together, getting a sense of, of uh, uh, patient outcomes uh, is essential to deciding exactly what sorts of interventions make sense. There's a, a now a huge body of literature indicating that self-assessment is inaccurate that none of us are any good at, 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 at making judgments about what we're good at. So you really do need to start with data about patients in order to decide what it is the curriculum you need to have in order to do your practice better. And, and this is obviously not a new idea. Osler came up, had a, a similar, can you see the quote there, um, uh, 50 or 80 years ago, more than that probably. Uh, the other thing is that, that the interventions that, that, that are actually done can't be, can't be forever. They can't be, you can't take doctors out of their practices and you can't, can't, make, them, you can't make them work for, for, for days. Uh, the, the cost of patient care is, is way too much. Um, so the interventions need to be short and focused. They need to be relevant. They need to be interactive. And to the degree possible, they need to be embedded in practice. And finally, putting some kind of a summative assessment at the end of that, I think, is absolutely essential. There's data that indicate that the, the, the performance on the, on the examinations that are currently available have a relationship to patient outcomes. And I think it's important to protect the quality of care given the decline in, in performance over time. I think uh, these kinds of assessments motivate uh, participation, uh, and they also establish a, a kind of accountability for the, for the profession. So there's good evidence that provo pr provider performance declines over time. Uh, there's also good evidence that it's not due to cognitive decline. It's due to a failure to keep up. Um, university healthcare system integration would support those kinds of interventions. Um, and summative assessment will, would ensure the quality uh, of care. So in summary. <laughs> Uh, oh, now, you tell, now you tell me I don't need to hurry up. Well, I don't need three minutes anymore. Uh, so in summary, quality and capacity, I think, are, are two of the biggest issues facing healthcare. Um, I think healthcare educational institutions can help by refining their admission standards and in incorporating much more diversity, both in student and faculty. 
uh, increasing the efficiency of learning by ramping up the amount of formative assessment we do and tamping down the amount of summative assessment we do. I think improving the quality of faculty uh, holds the possibility of, of both creating educational reform but as well supporting the quality of teaching. And finally, creating uh, lifelong learning and assessment relationships with uh, healthcare professionals as they work throughout their careers uh, holds the possibility of significantly increasing the quality of care. Um, so thank you very much, and I apologize for all the numerous uh, technical glitches. <laughs>
when the university or the authorities uh, would evaluate the education, mm -hmm. they might should use formative assessment instead of summative. No, no question about there. There actually um, one of the areas of much interest today is how to assess teachers. Uh, and in, in that instance, again, you're looking at a, that a system that needs to be both formative and summative. So you need both pieces in it, and the, the, the assessment of students and trainees should play a role in the assessment of teachers. So that those data can be used for both purposes. Yeah? Did I get there? Did I get close enough? Okay. Thanks, John. It was fantastic as always. And I would like just to share off you or to call your attention to an article we published after the Ottawa conference where I think it's linked to this because we cannot have only assessment of learning but we have to have assessment for learning and as learning and after the Ottawa conference and the General Medical Council both published very useful guidelines to move requisites from assessment just based on psychometric criteria toward the new requisites that are educational requisites in assessment. And I just wanted to share this. If you go to that article, it would be in line of what you said and also to the requirements of the General Medical Council on 2010. Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, regarding the, the formative assessment that you mentioned, mm -hmm. I'm under the impression that that is more time and cost intensive than a summative assessment. What about the shifting priority of lecturers and teachers between researching, getting grants, getting funds, and teaching students? So there are, I, have, I have a couple answers to that. It doesn't necessarily need to be more time consuming. Um, and in fact, if you take away much of the time that is currently being spent developing Summative assessment, <laughs> developing summative assessment, you're going to save a little bit of time. So that, that, that's the first thing. So there's going to be a little bit of a trade-off there. But, but let's, let's go to the second question, which is how does faculty balance all of, the, all of those things? And, and you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think one of, the, one of the real rate limiting steps in all this is getting faculty both an incentive to do it as well as the time to do it. So this, there needs to be some funding stream for this. There needs to be some reward for faculty in providing this on the one hand. On the other hand, the methods that we develop to do this need to fit as seamlessly as possible into the work setting. Um, so so lots, of the, lots of the methods that folks are talking about now, they try to fit in the context of work in, an as, in as efficient a, uh, a manner as possible. So there are a series of strategies for, for kind of managing that. But you're, you're absolutely right. Without incentives and without the time, this goes nowhere. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a US-based question. Was uh -huh. the recent change in the MCAT a step towards formative assessment? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I actually think the, the changes in MCAT, for folks who don't know, there's a uh, an admission test for medical school in the U.S. called the MCAT. And it's an examination everybody needs to take in order to, it's one of the things that are considered in the application process. And that's recently been changed. And I think it's been changed in order to incorporate more than just cognitive knowledge into the decision making for admissions. So the previous version of the MCAT was all knowledge. This, I think, tries to incorporate different kinds of, if I understand properly, different kinds of skills, different kinds of thinking uh, that might be taken into account in the admissions process. So it's not formative assessment, but it's a change, an important change, in, in terms of getting the right kinds of students into training. <coughs> sure. Ed? Um, I'm interested in the fact that we, we seem to be keeping you on formative and summative yeah. assessment, uh, but uh, I really took on board your comment about formative needs to be of a very high standard, that it's not second best to, to summative assessment. But uh, I wonder if you could comment on the fact that some of the really difficult areas to assess um,
can hardly yet be, be assessed summatively. I'm thinking of areas of professionalism, of areas of assessing the, the learner's professionalism. And, and um, we try to encourage a huge amount of formative assessment. And I'm thinking that perhaps this is a case where we need to educate learners better so that they can get many people's observations formatively and some responsibility rests on the learner to actually uh, bring together, decide what they're taking from assessment that may not be reliable in the sense of, of, of being uh, repeatable across, um, across different raters, but it may still be immensely helpful to the learner. That's, that's, a really, that's a really wonderful and imp important con concept and, and, and comment. Um, when you, when you think about assessment, even when, even when things aren't very reliable, one way to make them more so is to ensure that you have different faculty providing their perspectives and more than one faculty doing that, as well ensuring that the trainee is observed in different settings, in different situations by different faculty. So I think your, your, your comment is directly on point, especially for formative assessment. Um, what, you, what we need to encourage, uh, especially in the softer areas like professionalism where definitions haven't quite come as far along as they have in other areas, is to ensure that the trainee is exposed in a formative way um, to, to a number of different faculty in a number of different situations who all have the opportunity to provide their perspective on, on what's happening. And the, the only thing that's needed to support that, and the one thing we don't often do as much as we should is just to get faculty together for two or three hours to have a conversation before that happens because uh, um, lots of times the faculty will disagree with each other for for bad reasons for reasons that don't make any sense where reasons if they had spent five minutes talking to each other would have gone away and everybody would do things consistently um, so so getting that conversation together I think is, is really important once that conversations had there will be different perspectives, all of them val valid in some sense, and all of them important for trainees to take on board. So it's just getting rid of the junk before you do that. But that's a great comment. Yeah. yeah I was also thinking about, you said that, um, well, when you are a professional already, the self-assessment is not reliable, and mm -hmm. that we're not so good at that. Uh, but I think, perhaps in line with what we were talking about now, perhaps that's also something that we should work more with. I mean, to improve our yes. ability for self-assessment by getting feedback from others. And I think perhaps both in for trainees and for when we are professions. So can you comment on that? Uh, I'm completely on board with that. I think that's exactly what we need to be doing. One of the things that I... I like about some of the folks who are using peer assessment now is that they're asking me to f evaluate myself and then give the form to my eight friends and it goes back to my faculty supervisor and as well you have the results for everybody. And so when my supervisor sits down with me at the end of the day, uh, he can look at me and say, Norsini, uh, you rated yourself as a nine. Uh, but your colleagues rated you as a four, and the average resident as a five. So he can have an, a very important conversation with me that, that will help me in the future in terms of my own self-assessment. So uh, I think that's absolutely on target. Yeah. Sorry, Don't be sorry. Um, you are saying it's not reliable, but anyway, um, self-assessment should be one of the first step of any formative because if the student don't start by trying to see himself and say what he thinks about his performance he didn't see the gap to the others and he's not constructing the capacities for later lifelong learning and so on so more important than the results is that we give that opportunity could you comment on this so as a first step of any formative I absolutely couldn't, couldn't agree more. Eh? The, the, the data on the inaccuracy of self-assessment may be that we've never been taught how to do it. We don't know how to do it. We don't have enough external input to do it particularly well. So that's, that's one of the reasons I, I kind of like the, the, the peer assessment thing where you, where you get to do that kind of reflection 
And any time that you can incorporate that into, into any of the assessment devices, you've made things a little better. I, mean, I, I, don't know, I don't know of literature at this point that talks to the ability to improve self-assessment, but were I, uh, were I 10 or 15 years younger, I might, I might, that might be something to really look at, because that would be a lot of fun. But, uh, so that's, that's a really great comment. Good. I take a lot of space here now, but I thought it was so interesting, yeah. the things you were, and we didn't talk at all about, I think it was very interesting, your, this FAME uh, fellowship, mm -hmm. and, the, and uh, I think that's so interesting, and I wanted to ask you if you think that you learn too from these other countries, because uh, some of the, we run a, an international program in medical education, and uh, Sometimes I think that when we have uh, participants from other cultures, I think we need to think about that perhaps we are imposing our, our way of thinking about learning and that we don't really try to understand the, uh, this other culture and how, how they think and take that on board. That, that's a, that is an absolutely wonderful comment. There is no question that we, that we learn from the fellows and in fact, um, we, when, we, when, we, when we work with them, we make it clear that uh, all, the, all the knowledge is in the room uh, and that the, the goal of this is to share what you know. So very little of what we do is lecture-based. Almost all of what we do is interactive, uh, small group learning uh, that's driven by the knowledge and, and the cultural context that the fellows come from. So, and it's been an incredibly rich and rewarding experience having them. Yeah. <laughs> 